Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the 77th um, virtual bridge session, no less. And uh, a subject very dear to us, of course, is digital literacy. And in, order, in looking at a particular project today, we're pleased to welcome John Casey and Diane Gardner uh, to talk about citizen literacy and pedagogies uh, for, for digital skills. And with that, I will hand over to John to take it away. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um... Right, uh, here we go, share screen. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah, brill, 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 yep. brill. Um, let's see now, what I'm going to do as well, I'm going to just bring in the web page for the home, the home web page. This is the project web page. And I'll just draw your attention to events at the top right, and it's citizenliteracy.com. I would encourage you to visit this website. And this is a new bit that we've got on the website. Is we're including presentations or workshops that we're doing or that we're involved with. And here we are, is this workshop here that I'm doing with you. And I would encourage you to visit this page. Um, and I would especially encourage you to look at this from Sir John Daniels. I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, but I'll get on with the main presentation here. Um, okay, so this is a presentation about digital pedagogies for inclusion. And I've added a bit for this audience about educational technology strategies. And I have to apologise for my incredibly squeaky chair. I'm going to have to get a new one. I'll try and stand still. Um, so uh, the work we're doing is actually about textual literacies. It includes some digital literacy, but it's about adult literacy, um, about teaching adults who cannot read and sp who cannot sp write and read English properly in the UK. And our work is funded by these organisations on the right hand side. Um, the UFI Vocational Trust, uh, NESTA, uh, in conjunction with the Department for Education. In fact, we've got two grants from NESTA for, for this work. Uh, and the standout work that we're doing that's probably got to be especially of interest to you folks is the smartphone app that we're developing which features some artificial intelligence, voice recognition, handwriting recognition. Uh, well, I'll talk about that later on. So a bit more about the project. Um, it often comes as a great shock to people to realize that there's 6 million people plus of working age in the UK with very low levels of literacy. And, and this has got big implications for the whole of society. Um, and I'm thinking here for the CDN, these are what we would consider to be important issues, equity and social justice. But we're also going to talk about learning design methods later, which I hope will be useful to people uh, and learner engagement. And I've added a bit in here about strategic changes because we started our work before COVID hit actually last year, but we were already dealing with some of the hardest to reach learners in the UK. Uh, and so some of our work might have lessons for traditional mainstream education in, in the current uh, situation. Um, so, so here's our learners um, and they're a very diverse group. And unfortunately, there is a lot of moralistic negative stereotypes about adults who cannot read and write properly. And as you'll see from the pictures here, they're, they're very different. There's all kinds of people and all kinds of ages. In fact, one of the funding agencies that we're working with, when they saw this picture, there was gasps of astonishment because people on the Zoom call said, my God, these are people of my age whatever age that is and it's interesting here that we have mental models in our heads about people and like i said before some of them can be very negative and stereotypical so for instance most of these people are actually the owners of smartphones as you can see here um, and they use them 
despite not being able to read and write very well. Um, and most of them are in work. So again, this is challenging some of these um, stereotypes. But there's a big stigma around owning up to low literacy. And I don't know if you might have seen the, the programme on Channel 4 recently with Sandy Toxfig, the write-offs. Uh, and that was quite moving about people owning up to low literacy and doing something about it. I would encourage you to go and watch that programme if you get a chance. Channel 4, it's on Channel 4 streaming, and it's called the write-offs. Um, but as, we, as our society is becoming increasingly digital, um, these people are going to be suffering more and more. So our position as regards literacy is that textual literacy is actually the foundation for digital literacy. So that they're, they're intertwined here. Now, policy-wise, there's been a lot of interest recently in digital literacy for obvious reasons. But research in this area stops uh, for these six million people. Re digital literacy research only kicks in around English entry level three or N uh, level one. So there's a big research challenge there. And in a way, this is what we're doing. We're doing, if you like, applied research and action research, which is very fitting for the further education sector. Um, so textual literacy is the foundation for digital literacy. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about learning design. Um, the, sp the smartphone app that we're developing is actually part of an integrated package of adult literacy course resources that we're developing. That also includes, most importantly, printed resources for use in class. There's a shortage of uh, integrated resources using the phonics methods uh, for adults in the UK in paper, never mind digital. But the unique function of the app that we're developing is that it can be used between classes to allow learners to practice. Um, and the challenge that we've got here is it's going to be on smartphone delivery, so you're limited in space. But there's an additional challenge here is these are low literacy, no literacy users, so we can't use traditional uh, textual interfaces and menus. So there's big interface constraints here. So what we're doing is we're using um, text-to-voice tutor personas powered by uh, Amazon Web Services, artificial intelligence. Uh, and that's proving really useful, incredibly useful, in fact. And we've got two uh, tutor personas involved in this, a male voice and a female voice. Um, is that um, uh, it also it also features handwriting recognition as well and handwriting is still really important in learning to read and write we think um, because of the physical act of linking the shapes of letters and words to the meaning is it helps to encode that knowledge and like it says here it's part of an integrated package so it's not it can be used as the st a standalone App, but it's actually to support a printed course for use in class. Uh, and the standout aspect of our app is it's free. There's no ads, no registration, and no personal user data captured, because we think all of that makes sense for the, this learner cohort. Um, what else? Do, 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 do. I'll carry on. OK, a bit more on learning design. Um, so literacy teaching is a very complex activity. So what we engaged in, uh, some of our developers and myself sat in on some of Diane's uh, lessons uh, to, to see how Diane teaches and to see how the learners react to that teaching. So there was a lot of teacher observation involved and a lot of learner observation involved. And the techniques we've been using are a mix and these might be useful to people involved in learning design more generally in further and higher education. Um, so we, we, these methods would be called knowledge elicitation in artificial intelligence, which sounds very fancy, but all it means is you're just watching what people do and you talk to the teacher, in this case, uh, Diane, to find out what she's doing, why she's doing it, what she thinks she's doing. And then the learning design people have to decode that and recode it 
for an experience on a mobile phone. Um, oh, now I should say as well that as well as the smartphone app, the same smartphone app is also going to be made available as a web app with extensions for teachers to use in the classroom. And that will also be uh, free under the same terms as the smartphone app. Um, the other thing that we've got here is some frameworks and techniques that we're using. Um, so for the teacher training, because I should also mention we've got two types of learners here. One is the adult learner with the smartphone app and in the class, but also we've got teachers that we're essentially training to deliver this course. So we're using a mixture of things. We're using um, Laurel Ad's conversational framework for the tutor training resources that we're producing. And for the app itself, we're using something from the world of instructional systems design. And I'll talk a bit about that later, uh, called task analysis. Uh, task analysis or action analysis is potentially really useful for those people who are engaged in creating um, blended learning, e-learning resources for practical skills, because adult literacy teaching is a practical skill in a sense, like uh, catering or bricklaying. Um, and actually, this might be a good position now for me to bring in Diane to talk a little bit about her work, if that's okay with you, Diane. No, I hope you don't mind me comparing you to a bricklayer. No, no, I'm fine. I've built a wall in my garden, so I'm happy to be compared um, to, uh, to a bricklayer. Um, yeah, so everything that John says, that's that's exactly what's happened. They, in fact, Kenji and, and John came in <clears throat> with a couple of others just to sit in my class because I'd, I'd been using phonics uh, to teach adults. I'd created a programme called City Phonics. Um, which is an accredited city and guilds programme, which takes students through a very structured um, course um, in order to teach them how to read and write. And, and it's just as you saw in the image there, like, these are my students um, of all ages. There's no point in going into why they're in the class, why they can't, they can't communicate, why they can't read and write. There's, we don't have enough time for that. The fact is that they managed to get through that kind of barrier of phoning and asking for help and they, they ended up in my class so um, lots of success with City Phonics and just happened to come across John in the college and lo and behold um, the format of City Phonics or the format of teaching adults how to read and write using phonics but again it's not just phonics and um, we, we start off with phonics but we include um, basic grammar and punctuation and the alphabet and so in effect I'm using literacy and it, like as if I'm teaching a language, um, because it also we've also found that um, the aspects of this course links really really well with ESOL students who can speak English but who can't read and write. So we've got lots of interest from all over the world. I'm sure John will tell you about later on, but um, it actually fits with what's needed because the reason I created City Phonics was because there was a gap. There was nothing for my students. There was the the first course, uh, certainly in Scotland, um, assumed that students could read and write 80 words um, even before they, they began. And there was all the resources had instructions, read this to your tutor, do this, do that, um, work in pairs. But of course, my students didn't know how to read the instructions, never mind to the, do the work. So this is what we've done in the app is that we've created a structure, but also down the side, if you, if you have time to, to have a look at it, please do, you'll see there's instructional videos. So we don't, again, we don't assume any, any knowledge of being able to read and write. What we would hope that someone is directed to the website, so someone is directed to the app, and they would have someone who can just say, right, just go with it and just press the buttons. And then there's a the videos to, to tell them exactly what to do. And then they can, there's, we've included everything that we think that they would need in order to be um, to get started on the app um, and the, the tutor resources um, are there to support students in class and also you know to help the tutors and also the the student workbook so in effect the student has something that's um, like concrete you know it's actually it's their own work you know, um, rather than just printing out printing out all the time and the tutors have thank you and um, and the tutors have something that they can look at they can actually 
um, all right, this is lesson one, oh, this is why I'm doing this, or this is supported by the social practice model, or this is supported by Bloom's Sigma 2 problem. Um, so there's, we've, I, for me, it's wonderful because um, I was struggling and, 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 and trying my best to, to, to teach my, my students. And yeah, there's 6 million and that's all over the UK, but in, in Glasgow, there's a lot of them, young people, older people, people who are struggling, who just, just manage just because usually with help, don't read letters, don't, don't do anything but without help. I have a new student um, who's, um, is, John, is, is it okay if I tell him about Hannah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. So with this new connection with a, a student and her, her daughter, and her daughter is going to be one of the advocates for us. Um, she's um, going to review the app for us. But um, this is a, a woman who's actually younger than I am, but who can't read or write at all, who's got a lot of children, who are teachers and, and doctors and physicists and all sorts of different things. It's bizarre. But um, so the children all got her a laptop and a smartphone um, and they contacted me because she says in Nottingham, but there was nothing apart from children's books um, to help her read and write. And the, the librarian looked me up, or looked up teaching adults, contacted me, and now she links in with me. And we sent her, there's, John, I'm, I'm sure we'll tell you about a tester and um, user feedback that we would encourage you to have a look at. So we sent that to the daughter and I think it was last Saturday, she couldn't get her mother off the laptop because she was going through the app all the time. Yeah. And again, that's a great thing about it is that you can return to it all the time and you know embed the knowledge. So, and it's the first time her mother, her mother has ever used a laptop to learn. It's usually just watching, uh, so watching TV. Just so, to, sorry, this is the time to come back into the presentation about all things know, digital, yeah. Yes, there we go. Right yeah. So that's the link between this and textual literacy and digital yeah. literacy, which mm -hmm. is a nice one. So just to come back to the presentation, if for relevance, especially for this audience, I think, I would encourage you to investigate ABC Learning Design, which is based on Laurel Ad's conversation model. Um, and I would also, also encourage you to investigate using the ADDI model, which is not well known in further and higher education in the UK, but is widely used around the world. Um, uh, there are some negative uh, ideas about this, that it's somehow stuck in the time warp of behaviorism from the 50s and 60s. Uh, it's absolutely not true. ADDI is just a, fr a process framework that can incorporate any educational theory. Um, and it's especially useful in the current climate, I would argue. Uh, I've got some useful links and resources towards that at the end of this uh, presentation that are on the website <laughs> that you can get. And all it stands for is analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And actually, a lot of this originates from the OODA loop ideas from the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, and it's yes, it is linked to warfare, but it's just common sense. Um, so moving on, oh, hang on, back, there we go. So what we would like you to do is, hang on, I'm just trying to find the right slide. Very much get involved. Um, tell your adult education, ESOL or community lecturers about us and encourage them to visit the website, citizenliteracy.com. Uh, they can get involved at the, the, the link, get involved. And we've got a test and feedback page, which I'm just going to show you very briefly. It's all right. Uh, test and feedback. And on this page is a direct link to the app. It's a web app, so it'll just fire up in your browser and it should work. Uh, apart from a Mac, the voice recognition won't work. Uh, and then there's feedback. Uh, options here uh, and they get involved oh yeah if we go down as well there's two uh, a teacher handbook and a student workbook are what we're working on as well which has got to be part of the package they'll be charged for but the app will be free always under those conditions I mentioned um, and there's instructions about how to use the app there just coming back to this um, if you could do that, and if you want to provide feedback on the app from your own point of view, that would be really good. Um, just remember that the app is intended for someone with low literacy. 
uh, and evaluating feedback from that point of view. And the feedback that we have had at you so far is both encouraging and really useful. We very much encourage people to get involved and provide feedback. Um, so where am I now? Um, oh yeah. So a little bit more on the tech front, if you like. Um, we're using text to voice, we're using voice recognition, we're using handwriting recognition. So that's a bit, that's three different types of artificial intelligence we're using. Um, and the approach that we're using is partly um, inspired by this, which may seem a bit strange at first, frugal innovation, which is common in the developing world where people do very innovative things with very little. Uh, and because we're working in high tech, this might seem inappropriate, but actually a lot of what we're using is very common in our world. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're building on solid existing stuff. Reinventing the wheel, by the way, is something which many educational technology projects fall prey to. We're not trying to do that. What we have done, though, is we have rejected using development frameworks like React and Angular. We've worked with them before, but we don't like them uh, in some aspects. They are powerful and they can uh, help you make things quickly, but they are black boxes. Uh, and they build in, um, they've got a sense of built-in obsolescence. Parts of them will get deprecated. So we've gone back to retro programming. We're using pure HTML5 and JavaScript uh, from the ground up. This means it's going to be easy for us to maintain going into the future. Um, we're also using no databases in the back end, which may sound a bit strange, but that's got an advantage and it's going to be quick and it's also cheap. The learning design is stored in JSON, uh, a data format. I'm not super technical, uh, but this is what we're doing. Um, and we're also inspired by the work of a guy called Norm Friesen from Canada, uh, who's published a really fascinating book about the use of technology in the development of literacy over the course of human civilization. I'll talk briefly about that. And uh, it's called the long jury approach. Look, looking at things that have stayed constant through the development of literacy and literacy teaching over time. And the illustration is from the front page of our white paper. We've published a white paper on our work, which is a, a technology thing, a technology industry thing. People publish white papers. It's not a, a government white paper. Um, so let me just carry on a bit here. Um, so this is our roadmap for what we're developing. At the moment, we're up here uh, at the beginner level, but we're aiming to do these levels, part one and part two, that would take a learner all the way from absolute beginner to O level pass. And I should stress that the app that's been released for testing, we've just released lesson one, and that lesson one is aimed at a complete beginner. That's the kind of thing a learner will be dealing with. Uh, so please look at it from that point of view. Um, Just a minute or two left. Okay, don't. Well, that's that's well timed for me then. Here's some influences on our work, and to keep Diane happy, I'm going to highlight this guy, um, Paulo Freire, who wrote this book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, an inspiration to many educationalists around the world. And his work stressed the need to keep things relevant to people's life. I'm getting a big thumbs up from Diane here. Uh, make educational relevant to the learners. Um, a lot of good stuff in there. This guy here with the fridge, um, that's an example of frugal innovation from the developing world. Uh, making a fridge from clay, and using water to cool it. It's some fascinating work going out on there. Here we've got Diane Lorillard um, teaching as a design science. I really recommend people to read that. Um, another woman, Enid Mumford, uh, Systems Design. Uh, she gave us, her and her colleagues gave us the ideas about socio-technical design, which is really relevant now for strategies for coping with the future. It's not just technology, it's the social aspect. Um, this guy here is um, 
a guy in America, Don Clark, uh, systems design models. Um, I really recommend people visit his site. A really humane approach to instructional systems design. Very readable, very good. Um, uh, Ezio Manzini, participatory design, another big influence on me personally. Uh, it's moving on from agile design, you know, just talk to your users, you bring your users in to design something, so they've got a real say in it. So it's, it's and this guy, um, Comenius, a Czech uh, educationalist who advocated uh, universal education for everybody and lifelong learning. An educational technology giant in that he invented the illustrated textbook way back and advocated using ordinary language and not, lang uh, not Latin for inclusive education. And this woman, uh, Louise Michel, a revolutionary from the Paris Commune, but most importantly, an educational reformer who opened uh, schools for refugees in London. And this guy, if we get a chance to talk about him, Sir John Daniels, ex-head of the OU, uh, second commander in UNESCO, I think, head of the Commonwealth of Learning, He's just released a webinar about how mainstream education institutions might learn from the history of open and distance learning to cope with the COVID uh, crisis that we're involved in. Um, let me see now. Uh, tips and strategy for the future for you guys, if you want to use it. Um, that's his webinar there. I've actually put a link to it on our website in our presentations area, because this link is a bit broken. Uh, Laurel adds a conversational framework, ABC toolkit. If you haven't used it, please have a look at it. It's really good. And stuff here about ADI and task analysis. Briefly, briefly, very briefly, educational theories. Do not be intimidated, choose wisely and be critical. The quote at the top is from a lecturer that I worked with in London. Um, he was a fashion lecturer at the University of the Arts, London Central St. Martin's College. He'd just been through the PG cert from the Educational Development Unit. And this was his, uh, he had this phrase, all those words, man, all these theories, you know, he just, <laughs> it was blowing his mind. Um, but this is a really important quote from Professor Graham Giggs. Gibbs, not Giggs. A good deal of educational literature is dull, impenetrable, or useless, or even all three at the same time. It doesn't mean you shouldn't read theory, but you should read it critically. And there is some really dodgy stuff out there. Um, okay, just gonna go on. Now, this is a good point for me to stop because my mouse regularly stops. Oh no, here we go. I, I have ended. And at the bottom here, which is on our website, there's loads of useful links for you to follow up. I'll stop sharing now. Oh, one thing I can share just before I stop. Um, let me just show you. I have put in this bit for you the slides and also a link to John Daniel's slides and recordings there that I would really encourage you to visit. I've also put this in as well which you might find useful. This is something I did way back with Coventry University and later on in open education. Um, and it might be very useful at the moment. It's the idea of ed tech educational technology acting as an X-ray machine on your organization. It shows up lots of things that you might not want to see. So that I think that could be quite useful to you. Right, I'm, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, we've just about come to the end of 30 minutes. Um, Jamie has uh, put up on the text uh, panel a comment about the fact that uh, the uh, responsibility for digital literacy among staff um, is uh, often, well, it can be found in many, many different places um, uh, around uh, institutions. That's something we might uh, uh, discuss in further discussion. It, it seems that, uh, well, this the, the app looks fantastic and the project looks uh, um, as if it's very effective. And it's, it seems that it's taken quite a long time then to get to this point. Are we making the best use of digital and supporting literacy? Um, Six million people to to uh, support is quite a lot. Um, where are we on the journey, I think, is the question. Yeah, well, one of the comments that we've had 
which is encouraging, is why hasn't anybody done this before? Mm -hmm. So that makes us feel like we're in a good space. Um, I think policy-wise, adult learning and adult literacy has been on the back burner for a long, long time. And the danger at the moment with the crisis that's going on and the incipient surge in unemployment is that these people are going to be pushed even further back. So there is a social justice element to what we're doing. So um, we're not forgetting paper. The actual paper side of our work is just as important. Um, and the app is not going to be replacing uh, physical teachers. And we don't want to get into being presented in that way. Um, so using the app the way we're doing it, we've got this phrase, um, we're using high tech for low literacy learners. So it's about time they got a crack of the whip, a whip of accessing good digital learning resources of which there's not much around for adults. There's quite a lot for children and kids, but putting this for a suitable format for adults has been a bit of a challenge as well. And that's a very crucial point. And I think uh, with that, I'm going to draw the just the recorded session to an end. So thank you, everyone, for, for taking part and uh, and hope to see you at a live at a, a virtual bridge. I have certainly seen the light today, quite literally, in fact. And uh, and with that, I'll bring the formal bit to a close.